I do not know in what order I'm going to introduce the speakers, maybe in the order in which they are going to speak. My name is Alexander Baunov, the senior executive at Carnegie Center, chief editor of Carnegie.ru. And now I introduce the others, Richard Dilbert, Politologist at Drexel University, Victor Wachstein, Director of uh, Center of uh, Sociological Survey, Rank Hicks, uh, and Sergei Solonin, the founder of uh, the Great Resource Kiwi. So I have read Adam Smith, and um, I do not remember his precise quote, but uh, this quote is simple. To trust is uh, more beneficial than to mistrust. And he developed a whole theory saying that this uh, benefit of confidence or benefit of trust uh, is um, economically founded. The whole economy is built on trust. Even if uh, you have been cheated once, it's uh, more beneficial to trust than to distrust. When we look at societies, we can see that the societies are more successful where people have more trust towards each other. And there's an example dating back to the 1930s or 1940s. Uh, and uh, there's a quote that uh, an Indian shoemaker, after receiving an order, should then execute the order and use uh, at least uh, the materials of the same quality as in the sample. Otherwise, this shoemaker will not have respect for himself any longer. So this is this one-time trust. And we understand that this successful confidence is uh, where we have this uh, multi-time trust, ongoing trust. Uh, and where people are more inclined to trust uh, to those people who they do not know. If we look at the East, there's a lot of uh, trust there. And in the East, how is money transferred? Why uh, a person who exchanges money, whom uh, you know for a lot of time, maybe this is a family business, but at the same moment, you have trust. Uh, you trust uh, your personal acquaintance, not an institution. While in Western models, of course, there should be someone's presence on the market for years. But you trust uh, an institution rather than a human. Russia was traumatized in the 1990s so this is a country with a low level of trust. And we can see that uh, there are very few institutions that are trusted. There are just a few institutions that are trusted more than mistrusted. And this is generally the political leadership. Uh, it's the president to a smaller extent, the army, the church, and all the other institutions in Russia are distrusted rather than trusted. And uh, small businesses uh, are trusted three times uh, more than big businesses. And big businesses uh, are less trusted by three times, uh, which is probably also the results uh, of the trauma of the 1990s when Russian businesses acted as the Indian shoemaker. They believed that this trust was a, a kind of one-off success. You should benefit from this trust and then leave the market. So it takes a lot of time for trust to return to Russia. But what we are seeing at this moment is happening at the level of a city. And this involves the development of various 
horizontal links and sharing services. When a person tries or starts to share with others what previously was considered to be his own property by 100%. It was considered that having a personal car is uh, your success 100%. And now we can see that this is uh, displaced by car sharing model. Sometimes you share your business with others or you share other things. And this trust is developed not vertically, that is, uh, I have trust in the president and the president guarantees uh, my property. But this trust starts developing horizontally. And as, as a result, we get a different community, a different society. And sociologists uh, traditionally show our low level of trust in anything. But at the same time, in parallel with this mistrust inherited from the 1990s, we are starting to get a space of trust arising from our horizontal links, uh, from our sharing services. Uh, that was my word of introduction, of course. Uh, each of the speakers uh, has their own topic. And I even don't know whom to start with. I am advised to start with Richardson Dilbert. And we'll speak about strong and weak ties in, in the city or in the society. Yes. So you can start. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, mm -hmm. turn it on. Thank you for having me. I'm going to take this off. Uh, so I, I wanted to, I was, I was given a, given a, a, a question, a, a, a prompt question earlier that was uh, uh, largely um, reiterated by Alexander. Um, and I just wanted to start with a, with a very simple sort of, uh, I think, theoretical framework around cities. And that's, I think if we borrow from some strain of uh, evolutionary developmental psychology, we can sort of uh, say, and it's I, I think uh, the uh, from from the work of uh, Michael Tomasella at the Max Planck Institute, we think of uh, cooperation and human cooperation as a product of evolution. One of the big problems is that uh, cooperation as a function of evolution works in tandem with competition. That is, uh, cooperation is an evolutionary function uh, is also a function of competition, and so you have a fundamental. Uh, means of human cooperation by defining in-group and out-group, creating a sort of fundamental in-group, out-group binary. Um, and cities, of course, are not evolutionary functions. Cities are uh, products of market forces or they're uh, consciously constructed institutions. Um, and I think one of the real key insights, especially from, uh, for me, one of the key insights from Jane Jacobs's 1961 book, The Death and Life of Great American Cities, is the idea of a unique urban community, uh, an urban community that's based in large part on market relations, that's based not on the kind of uh, strong but exclusive ties that define that in-group, out-group binary, but uh, that, that produce the strong tie, weak tie binary. That is, uh, the notion of urban community as a community that's uniquely defined by weak ties, that's a, that's a, a circumscribed form of community but that uh, one is that, that's also uniquely inclusive and therefore accommodating of difference and diversity and makes the potential for larger scale human interaction possible. Um, and uh, so I just want to use that basic distinction between the sort of the transition between the transition in the process of historic urban development from the in-group, out-group binary to the strong tie, sort of weak tie binary. And of course, I think every city is defined by a unique constellation of layered, uh, strong tie exclusive groups and the, and, and the patterns of uh, overlapping weaker tie inclusive groups. Um, so I want to use that to just discuss uh, quickly, or at least mention in my, in my brief time, uh, uh, four, four areas where I think that, that that's relevant. 
uh, and and of course the the social capital tie-in is is the is is really the development between the the weak tie strong tie dichotomy that really came to define a lot of the social capital research in the first part of the 21st century in the first decade of the 21st century when it was really sort of a booming academic uh, topic. So uh, the first uh, the first issue is especially since the topic of this conference is megacities. I think, uh, to a great extent, the extent to which megacity development, especially in the global south, has been defined by unprecedented scales of rural to urban migration. Uh, and the chief threat, which has been realized in many places for rural to urban migration, is really the triggering of the in-group, out-group, uh, 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 the in-group, out-group uh, dichotomy. And the real threat that that poses to creating unprecedentedly large uh, urban underclasses, uh, which will uh, restructure a society and really, I think, create a sort of a, a sort of permanent social structure uh, that is is uh, I think is is really a threat um, for several reasons. That's a humanitarian issue, uh, as the loss of human potential, and as a massive uh, producer of negative externalities. Uh, you know, I mean, in terms of issues of public health an overall city's image, crime, what have you. Uh, so I, I think that that's especially important and a city's ability to somehow accommodate the, the and, and somehow deal with that potential, the potential of, of uh, urban underclass development as a product of massive rural to urban migration um, uh, is, is importantly determined by the extent and character of the mix of strong ties and weak ties. Uh, the second thing I would say is, uh, it, 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 uh, it is, is so that there's that connection in, in, uh, in, in terms of that, is that formal institutions matter in terms of structuring the relationship between strong ties and weak ties. And here I'll just quickly mention two examples and two very different examples. Um, the role in uh, the the you know in, in Chinese rural to urban migration, which has really led to that massive growth uh, of the sort of Chinese megacities, and the role of the Chinese household registration system, the hukou system, um, on the one hand, uh, I think uh, exacerbates exclusion. That is maintaining your rural household registration uh, when you're an urban migrant. Of course, means that you're excluded from many. Uh, of, the, of the benefits of people with urban huku. At the same time, the maintenance of rural huku creates a circular migration pattern, which works to the benefit of, uh, I think, of, of, of a lot of the Chinese urban population. And also, that institutional tool allows for a certain tweaking of, uh, a, a, a tweaking of that registration sy system, sometimes a city-specific tweaking, that allows for greater and more gradual integration. It certainly has a lot of negative aspects, but I also think it could be an effective policy tool in a lot of respects. And now to compare that to the, the period of rural to urban migration that defined the growth of American cities, and that's especially during the 20th century, um, a much lower scale rural to urban migration when African Americans in the United States migrated en masse from the rural southern areas, especially to northern and midwestern cities. Um, that was the real, one of the real moments of American domestic rural to urban migration and really turned the American, African American population from an almost exclusively rural population to a largely urban population. And the institutional tool that was used there was the legal separation in the United States between city and suburb and white out migration to the suburbs and the distinction between school access between central cities and suburbs. And that created a significant problem. I would say that is one of the chief policy failures uh, in urban development in the United States. And we still have the experience of it in terms of large urban underclass populations, the intergenerational transmission of poverty. And as Robert Sampson showed in his book, Great American City on Chicago, the real permanence of that spatially defined urban underclass development that's a, that's a significant problem and one that we frankly haven't grappled with very well in the United States. So the third point I want to do is, is, is to say something about the sharing economy, since I think that's one of the themes of this panel. And uh, I just would make this point. I think uh, in terms of talking about the sharing economy and social capital and human trust and cooperation, 
I just want to mention that I think one threat that's not necessarily realized, but one concern that, that I think is relevant to the growth of sharing economies, and it would vary from different types of sharing economies, is the potential to replace altruistic behavior with market behavior. The extent to which I think a sharing economy would encourage more forms of what you would call sort of horizontal activity, but at the same time, it would reduce the smaller but conceivably more significant uh, genuine sharing uh, and genuine cooperation. Uh, the second element I think that about the sharing economy is when Jane Jacobs made her fundamental insight about um, the nature of urban community, it's a highly unstable form of community because it's, a, a rel it's based on weak ties. And to a great extent, she said that it's sustained by urban planning and urban architecture. That is, the housing stock and the street plan of a city really determine the extent of those weak ties. A sharing economy is really defined by, in large part, the same, the, a market-based sharing economy is defined in large part by the same kind of weak ties. But what we've done is replace the uh, infrastructure of the city and its role in maintaining those weak ties with a website. And I think that that's a really fundamental distinction um, with really sort of unknown implications in terms of what it would do to the relationship between city planning and the relationship between city planning, social interaction, and social trust. Um, the final point that I just want to make is the relationship between corruption and uh, social capital or corruption and social trust. Certainly nothing's going to erode urban-based social trust than, uh, than, than, than corruption um, and a lack of trust in social institutions and government institutions that would come with sort of pervasive, uh, pervasive corruption. But not all corruption is created equal and there's no single uh, uniform way of dealing with it. But I think that the distinction between strong ties and weak ties is important for diagnosing what in fact corruption is and therefore thinking about what you could do. And I would just say that you know, it, if, it, it, there's a corruption of weak ties and it's frequently sort of termed transactional forms of corruption. That's the, the low level corruption of having to pay a small bribe anytime you need a government service performed. Right? That's where it's a, it's a corruption of strangers and it's a transactional corruption where uh, you're, you know, you're, you're, losing, you, you, you're losing trust in social institutions because uh, you have to pay extra for the services that you're supposed to get normally. But then there's the corruption of strong ties. There's the corruption of very intimate, uh, intimately bonded groups who collude in order to capture more public benefits than they're really allowed to have, they have some access to power, and they're able to use that in order to corrupt a system typically at higher levels, and then we find out about it typically uh, through exposés or, or, or some other means other than sort of the pervasive kind of transactional corruption. It's very different and very different means by which you would have to deal with it, but I think fundamentally it's based on the distinction between strong ties and weak ties, the extent to which a city is defined in terms of the relationship between those two fundamental forms of social interaction is also going to have an impact on, uh, on, on how you would diagnose that problem of corruption and what kind of solutions you would bring. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, not to take time of other speakers, just may I ask one question? Yeah. In, in the cities, there are good areas Sometimes, not in Moscow, but, <laughs> not, but in, normally in American cities there are good areas and bad areas. For non-specialists as I am to understand where are ties stronger or weaker and bad areas or good areas? Uh, that's a, I think that's a great question. And um, uh, I can speak especially to, um, the, uh, to, to the city that I know best, which is the city I live in, Philadelphia, which is the sixth largest city in the United States, relatively small by global standards, but large by American standards. Uh, it's 1.6 million people in a metro area of about 4 million. Um, and it's defined, it's, it's, it's very similar to the city of Chicago. It's defined by a very high poverty rate and a high spatial racial segregation. So within the city proper of 1.6 million people, we have a 27% poverty rate. Half of that population lives at half the poverty income, so deep poverty. So you've got a 13% deep poverty rate 
practically on the edge of homeless, if not homeless. Um, and that's really defined in terms of the specific neighborhoods that you see. Um, and there's anywhere probably between, depending on how you count it, 200 to 300 neighborhoods. Um, the, uh, uh, there's a, an organization called the Philadelphia Health Management Corporation, which runs large-scale surveys that are mostly public health-related surveys in the city of Philadelphia, and it asks social capital-related questions. And what it finds is, first of all, the extent to which somebody reports social activity and neighbor-based social activity will have an impact on health outcomes uh, and tends to have an impact on wealth regardless of uh, neighborhood income. So it has a really significant impact. Um, and in my own work with neighborhood commercial development, um, you can see, I, I think in general, uh, you have lower levels of social ties. You tend to, in, in poor neighborhoods, you tend to have community organizations that, that, that come to life but that, that are eclipsed faster the social ties are more constrained to the neighborhood, um, uh, but, but it is, it's a significant impact. Those social networks are really playing a role in terms of, uh, in, in terms of alleviating some of the, the worst forms of, of poverty. But at the same time, they're far more at risk given spatially defined, spatially concentrated poverty. Um, and one of the big threats, and this is something that Samson talks about as well, is, is when a community comes to depend on only one or a few social institutions, that's when it faces the real threat. And in poor communities in Philadelphia and Chicago is very similar. Um, other cities are sort of special cases. Uh, you know, the big threat is when your community comes to only depend on the local church. That's okay. sort of the last institution that's standing. It faces a real intergenerational threat given uh, generational changes in terms of church attendance. And so that's a that's a really uh, thank a crucial you. That moment. was interesting, especially because we didn't experience many things of you describe. I think that all those who uh, read uh, some sociology works know Victor Wachstein. I believe that his subject is um, very close to what we have just discussed. So, without further introduction, I give you the floor. Yes. We are exactly studying the strong and weak links within the, our project. And last year, we launched the project together with the uh, um, City Development Institute uh, regarding the banks of Moscow. And uh, uh, we wanted to study how the social um, capital can have the impact. Economists have their own theories regarding confidence. Um, uh, gradually, the reputation is accumulated, and uh, if uh, people are deceived later, they will not trust. And several types of trust were identified. First, trust to friends, uh, like Richard said. How many? Um, the answer to the question: How many people will come to your bury? burial and uh, how many people will you entrust your key so that they come to your apartment uh, when you are absent. There are also weak links, for example, people you know from university. And as the uh, Eurobarometer shows, in Russia there is a high correlation between the number of weak connections and uh, the, what we call moral justification of corruption. We cannot ask directly, when was the last time you gave a bribe and to what amount? Regarding positive attitude to corruption transactions, there is <coughs> relation. This is interpersonal confidence. There is also confidence to the public administration, the president, the healthcare system. In Russia, more than half of population will prefer to die by self-treatment uh, rather than going to the hospital if they don't know a specific doctor there. And the third important type is the general knowledge and general confidence. Confidence to unknown people. It is just uh, uh, about uh, people thinking that other people are not enemies. And uh, uh, according to Eurobarometer and other surveys in Russia, this indicator is very low. Now let's look how 
funny the uh, uh, correlation between these three types of confidence is distributed. Over the time of the research, the amount of interpersonal connections and thus trust uh, is increasing. The number of weak ties increased by two times. The number of strong ties increased by 50%. So people trust more pe people there they know. At the same time, the institutional trust and the general trust are sharply decreasing. So the more we trust our friends and people we know, the less we trust the national currency, the health care system, the public administration. There is also the institution of president. This is already a sacral institute. It's not considered as the authority institute. So there is also general trust. The more, the more we trust people we know, the less we trust people in general. I know another country where there is such a reverse correlation. It is Brazil. When two years ago we started to tr study trust, it turned out that um, in Russia uh, people trust in t technologies but don't trust people uh, and administration. We support unmanned uh, autonomous vehicles because we don't trust people on the roads. We trust uh, robot justices. Uh, at the same time, people don't trust courts. This is a funny correlation. Uh, people trust technology, but they don't trust people and institutions. There is this reverse correlation. At the same time, the more people trust people they know, the less people trust all the others. And that has an impact on the urban development, because for the city, it's the um, indicator of general confidence is crucial. Public authorities uh, build their idea uh, not because of corrupt in interest, but because they really want to do something good for people. Uh, the question is how people will perceive that when uh, the level of trust to um, city authorities and general trust is very low, this landscaping and improvement will not con be considered as something good. According to data we received three weeks ago, one quarter of Moscovites believe that the improvement made the city worse, and one third believe that the city remained unchanged. So less than half people in Moscow believe that the landscaping and improvement actually improved Moscow. To compare, in Tatarstan, 80 uh, I mean, in the, its capital, Kazan, 80% of people believe that landscaping is very good because they have a good level of institutional trust and uh, general trust. In Russia, in general, last year, city authorities took the first place, uh, price, uh, place in the rating of uh, lack of confidence uh, um, and uh, uh, they even left behind the courts. This year, actually, courts are again at the first place, but the city authorities are among the top three mistrusted institutions. So when we face large-scale urban changes, when the institutional trust and the general trust are at low level, these changes will be perceived negatively. That's the first point. The second point is um, the following. The level of general trust is very important. Uh, it is um, mm, the fact that you um, uh, that determines whether you feel safe when you're walking on the streets in the evening. Um, it is about trust to people who live in the same city with you. Uh, the trust that not of all, all of these people uh, represent a threat for you. In Moscow, we uh, accompany children to uh, metro and when we they come out of metro we ask them to call us regarding the embankment project um, the average uh, general trust level in these districts is quite high and people thus believe that uh, it is less likely to meet uh, a, a person who represents a threat in these district the renovation of embankments goes quite Far and it involves the international, um, the intervention of authorities into the uh, communities uh, that are in a sensitive situation. Uh, there are some embankments where 
people uh, grill meat all together. And then authorities will come there and say, we will build a park here. What do you think the reaction of these local residents will be? So uh, there is um, this issue of how the increase of personal trust decreases the general trust, how this will impact the embankment renovation project, and how to take into account uh, the social ties and their localization, uh, how based on that should we build the renovation scenario so that the case uh, of patriarch ponds does not become the M Moscow general conflict. That's the conflict between the locals and those who come after the renovation. The idea that we can take uh, uh, and adopt uh, and perform a very good project, then implement it and then report on it does not work anymore. Because today, uh, the project that enters into the areas where the ties are dense, uh, local residents' interests need to be taken into account. The embankments cannot be considered uh, as a general city environment. This is a local environment. We also started the demand for hipster urbanism. Uh, this is also not working for the case of the embankments. Uh, there are locals there who want to spend time there calmly with their families, and uh, the city authorities need to take that into account. That's a simple thought, but in order to achieve that um, result, we needed to conduct a research. Thank you. So basically, it was uh, a similar message in two languages, and we can make a conclusion that in uh, op opposite countries such as uh, the US and Russia are still there is some similarity. I've seen the signal that we don't have a lot of time left. I remember that. Just 30 seconds. I'd like to ask the question. Indeed, really 30 seconds. The USSR and today, um, where was it more trust? first question. The second question, how to um, get rid of the situation when people trust robots more than people? Well, regarding the USSR, in late USSR, the inefficiency of state institutions was compensated by personal ties. You need your own doctor, your own hairdressers, and so on. So we now witness a situation similar to the USSR, and many of my colleagues uh, can confirm that that's the first point. Second, how to avoid the situation when people trust a robot judge more. There is no way getting out of it. Um, technologies will allow people to um, kind of accept the uh, present and the future on uh, a fair election of a mayor, a robot would win, I'm sure. I think that maybe Sergei Salonin could um, argue that. I could argue as well, but I don't want to take the precious time of our session. When you speak ab about Kiwi project, Kiwi was for me one of the first projects when people started suddenly trusting something that is not a bank, not a uh, savings institution, uh, not a store. And people started entrusting their money um, to this system. And that uh, after the uh, trauma of the 90s, and that was also before the GPS linked services. So. That took place at early stages of internet development. Indeed, uh, the level of trust between people is low. People trust robots more. But on the other hand, robots are suppliers by, of people. Take Airbnb or uh, 
take uh, take the situation when uh, you accept people whom you don't know in your home or take cleaning services. Uh, people you don't know come to your place and you entrust your home to them. So uh, maybe these changes are taking place and they are not that simple. Sergey? Yes, thank you, Alexander. Many things have already been said in that respect. I'm not just an investor into Kiwi and CEO of Kiwi. There is also a big number of companies that are intermediaries between people. And I can say that actually such companies as you do or services for a big number of people or taxi sharing services in Russia Uh, even if the process of hiring people to perform such services is automated, people are still checked and a lot of digital traces are left. Uh, you can sit into a taxi uh, to the person you don't know, but uh, there are digital traces. If you use uh, services, uh, for taxi, for example, and uh, thus a lot of traces are registered. And uh, if you consider that from the point of view of potential illicit actions, uh, um, these traces will be preserved and will help to track the person. And uh, if there was no intermediary, if there was no robot intermediary, uh, there would be no such traces. And I think us that technologies play a big role here. Speaking about political issues, I see that there is trust to robots uh, due to the absence of corruption. Corruption may have a huge impact on trust. If I use artificial intelligence for judging or for checking something, I can be sure that uh, there is full objectivity in what this robot is doing. In case of a human being, it's not always the case. You made an exa uh, you gave the example of Tataristan uh, landscaping and improvement and uh, in Moscow. Uh, I know that uh, s uh, dozens of parks in Tatarstan were built with half of money uh, used for building the Zer only Zaryadia park. And people know about that. What I wanted to say is I wanted to present a new paradigm of thinking, present a new model of projecting the future. We have a community of almost 400 people, and we have already started implementing this model in the form of a new project. Um, this is a project about how people are coming together around the ideas of changing the environment that they are living in without the intermediaries in the form of a state, in the form of you know, authorities and those who help them. And there are some criteria of this model, and I will uh, make a short presentation. It will become clearer. The project started last February, the idea of the project is to change the urban environment. The project is based on the idea of a new way the business can organize. This is a restaurant business. The restaurant will be located in Moscow in the 
profit of this restaurant will, will be used to improve the urban environment. The participants of the project are thousands of active citizens who are not indifferent to their environment. They cooperate around human values, whereas the commercial part is just a way to uh, um, implement in life socially significant ideas. Um, each participant invests 100,000 rubles, and this money is used to open a restaurant that will host lectures, workshops, and other events aimed at improving the urban environment. And every person can organize the event. It is a socially responsible project, and visitors paying uh, for what they ordered know that the money will be invested for socially significant projects. Uh, we used the blockchain technology, which allows to distribute funds uh, in an absolutely transparent way. Each participant uh, can vote for the projects he would like to support, learn more, and become a participant of a unique self-development self community to um, make a difference in the life of your city. Thank you. So this project, or even this model of a socially significant business, a socially oriented business, which uses new technologies and which allows, on the one hand, the participants in the project to influence directly decisions within that project, because um, the participant gets a token, which means a vote in this environment. And this scheme works in such a way that people who participate in this model directly can run the project directly and can influence key decisions on the functioning of this restaurant. And the restaurant's entire profit is spent on social projects, which are also approved by the citizens, by those who take part in the project. And after that, the money goes to the accounts uh, of those projects with further reports. This is the legal structure of uh, what it looks like. This is uh, a non-commercial organization, a non-commercial, non-for-profit project. And along with the votes, it also issues tokens with which it pays uh, to the volunteers. That means that there is an internal system involving volunteers. And here, you can see how it works. We carried out a small study of those uh, who participated there. And it turns out that those who participated in the project are ready to continue working on that. And uh, they are ready for monetization of uh, certain services and uh, they provide their own services uh, free of charge. Today, there are 370 participants. We've uh, existed for four months now, and um, this is the split between different spheres uh, where those uh, people who participate today got from, you can see that we have uh, a lot of uh, finance people, we have uh, three film directors, uh, we have uh, a tennis Olympic champion, and we have three participants uh, from the Forbes 200 2018 list. There are also well-known restorators of Moscow, such as uh, 
Novikov, Gimza, the founder of Chai Hana number one, and um, now that uh, our first business is the restaurant business, it's uh, more understandable for people, it's uh, quite competitive, and everyone whom we've been talking with today agreed to participate there. And the general idea behind this community is to get together and to start making the city better via joint effort. And uh, I see it as an example of a community or a process that directly improves uh, the trust in an environment. I'm not sure whether this um, micro model is applicable on the level of a city, but the fact is that the participants directly influence uh, the decisions taken on what to do. These are very transparent decisions. It's the direct vote. It's the participants themselves that decide what to spend money on. Furthermore, those participants have a certain integri integrity because they pass through a filter. And if there is a new participant, and uh, a lot of uh, participants are recommended to us. So if uh, there are five votes against this participant, he or she is not allowed to enter. And we have a huge number of uh, people who unfortunately did not pass this test uh, within the community. Because in order to enter this community, you have uh, to pass a short interview. You have to explain why you want to enter the project. So there is a kind of filtration, and there is a unification of people on the basis of principles. On the other hand, it's a full technological transparency, which replaces this space of trust. And it's not just the voting that is transparent. We also have transparent financial guarantees. We use blockchain as a tool for transparency. And there's a lot of other things, uh, such as uh, procurement. All of this is reported on the internet. We understand that we have to do this because we are a non-for-profit organization. We don't have anything to save. We do not uh, have any profit. And uh, this is everybody's agreement at the beginning. But these elements, such as transparency and um, having considerable influence on the decisions uh, taken by the community really encourages people to enter this community. And today, we have our own building. We are starting to repair it. And we hope that we will launch the building by the end of the year. And we will wait for everyone to come and to see how such a new project, how such a new project of a community where the members uh, do not live together, where they are c connected uh, by the virtual space, uh, how they can join their forces for a social mission. We will, happy, we will be happy to demonstrate it to you. Thank you. I am really interested in those new ideas connecting restaurants to blockchains. This is like combining the uncombinable. And this is a non-commercial project. Yes, this is a fully non-for-profit project. Will there be just one such community, or will there be the third, the second, the third community? We already have a lot of uh, suggestions from the regions. And uh, we ask everyone to wait, because there are certain technological requirements, but we are working on that. But this is just a model, and this is a model on which you can base any business. I've already started uh, a discussion with uh, Timur and Mr. Mahmenov, and uh, we decided to do something good, not uh, for our own benefit, because uh, we do a lot of sponsorship on a 
voluntary basis. But we try to provide opportunities for people to participate in such models. This can be a successful business. You can support it, but on the other hand, you can influence the environment where you live via such a community. And I see that this is a new model. So if it works, it's, it's applicable not just to the restaurant business. We just chose the restaurant business as the pilot project because it's more understandable to people. But it's also a meeting place, a community. And this is uh, very close to what we are doing. And are you trying to find 1,000 participants, 1,000 co-owners of the restaurant connected with those principles? Yes, we invite everyone there. We invite you, Alexander. We are waiting for you there. That's our website of mesti.ru. Vmestie2018.ru. So look at the people who already participate on the website. This community already exists, and we use the social technologies inside. Very interesting. Unfortunately, we have to finish with this. And. Um, we have stated, unfortunately, that Russia is a society with a low level of trust, but there is a high level of trust uh, to your acquaintances, which is uh, not very good either. And we can see that some modern technologies, for example, those connected with the internet, with the GPS module, with the digital traces, in combination with exceptionally high trust in new technologies. Well, you don't have this technophobia in Russia that you can see in Germany or in France. But there is hope that all of this will help us stop this condition of uh, low trust in each other. But we don't have to um, underestimate it. Uh, there is a business model under which when you can see a, a passerby with a bag, you think, uh, why don't you take this bag away from him? But uh, in more developed societies, uh, uh, we understand uh, that we could be on the place uh, in the place of an old uh, man, and we don't try to take the bag away from him. And uh, we are more advanced than the societies uh, in some uh, less developed countries, because uh, there are countries where you just can't go to a certain district uh, after, well, at, at night hours, because it's too dangerous. So we are better than that. So at least I think that the changes in the environment, in the urban environment, resulted in the following. Now there is no separation between a rich car owner and a poor passerby. Because right now it's prestigious to be a pedestrian. There are beautiful views. You can't uh, enjoy all those views from the window of a car. And all those cars are blocked by the traffic jams. So when I drive uh, in a car in this beautiful city, I can feel that I lose a lot. So there is now no distinction between the poor pedestrian and the rich uh, car owner. So we need to stop being the society of low trust, and we need to take benefit from our trust in technologies. Thank you.